Pastor Lee Eklov up. Come on up, Pastor Lee. So as I mentioned, the Lord has gifted us in unique ways with, every, number one, by the way, everyone is gifted. I want you to know that. Everyone has a gift from God, and we are responsible of using those gifts. And God has gifted us also in unique ways with people with some exceptional um, callings and talents that they've honed. Lee is one of the gifts of God to us as a congregation and to me personally. He has been a friend. He's been a mentor. He's been a gift to me. He's been a gift to us. And it's so great for me knowing that, oh, you know what? I have to be gone for a week to help move our daughter. Lee, do you mind stepping up and preaching this passage? And he said, sure thing. I'll do that. And so I'm grateful for men like him who um, is come equipped. He has a love for the Word. He has a love for the people of God. He lo has a uh, love for this congregation and congregation. So he's been a pastor for, for decades. He's written a number of books, and I encourage you, you can find them on Amazon. I've read them all, and they are very, very helpful books. He continues to write a column for preaching today, and he's a part of our congregation. God has blessed him with them. He's often speaking in various places, helping pastors and ministers, but he's bringing the word for us today. So I'm going to say a brief word of prayer uh, for you and for us, and then um, you'll uh, bring the word for us. So God, thank you for my friend. God, thank you for your son, most importantly. God, thank you that he is a shepherd among us and a pastor to us. Uh, thank you that uh, he loves your word and he loves you dearly. God, he loves this congregation and the congregations of this world. God, as he speaks today, Lord, I ask that he would feel your presence in a particular way, that he'd feel your joy, God, that he'd feel your satisfaction. Lord, may his words flow freely. God, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, God, eyes to see, that we would hear your voice speaking to us. God, that we would see you, Jesus, clearer that you would truly be exalted in our lives in this congregation and in the world, God. So thank you for our friend. Thank you for um, a pastor among us, God. Bless him, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, that was nice. Dave's, uh, Dave and Gretch were, Gretchen were away this week, as he said, helping their daughter move from Nashville to Iowa City, which will mean that she's closer. She's, she's pursuing, uh, she's pursuing uh, doctorate. They've got a couple of smart girls, I'll tell you that. The unfortunate thing for David is that because of this week uh, being gone, he had to give to me the centerpiece passage in the whole book of Philippians. It, this, is the, this is the crown right in the middle of, uh, of Philippians. And I'm grateful and intimidated. Have you noticed in this church that we're not all that much alike? Has that ever caught your attention that we, we, we're not very much alike? This is the craziest assortment of church people I've ever been a part of. I mean, it's crazy. Right? So what in the world are we doing here? How in the world is it that we're together? Now, as I begin this message, I want to make sure we're clear about something. Most of you who are gathered here are believers in Jesus. You're disciples of Jesus. Part of that, the center of that then, is that as a Christian, my duty and delight is to grow in my faith, to be obedient to Jesus, to become like Jesus. Look at this picture I've got for you here. Got it there, Robert? Let's see if it comes up. If it doesn't, I'll move on. Well, what am I looking at? Black back here. <laughs> 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 Who 
Who screwed up these screens, anyhow? <laughs> Sorry. I love this picture. I do. I love this picture. That is our goal, is to look like Jesus. And how is that going to happen? <clears throat> well, let me go back to my question here about what in the world do we have in common? We have all been through various things, hardships and lessons and so forth, in our faith. And we've brought our faith to bear, right? We've brought our faith in Jesus to bear in the things we face in life, challenges and the hardships and everything. So let me ask you some questions. In those hardships, were you encouraged by being in Christ? Is that a yes? Okay, good. Okay, that's good. Uh, have you ever been comforted by Christ's love for you? Okay. All right. I like when you talk back. I served a church in Lincolnshire, which I loved dearly, but they weren't talkers. They were too sophisticated, you know. Has the Holy Spirit ever strengthened you through your fellowship with other Christians? Okay, good, okay. One more question. Have you ever experienced the Lord's tenderness and compassion? You have? You have? You guys have? So have I. That's what holds us together. That's what we have in common. All these things are what we have in common. So you know what would make the Lord happy, since that's true? Listen, we're in Philippians, as you've heard. We're in chapter 2, and we're at verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, check, right? Okay, we got that. If any comfort from his love, check. If any common sharing in the spirit, fellowship in the spirit, check. If any tenderness and compassion, check. Then, Paul said, and he says what Jesus would say, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love for one another, the same love that Jesus gives you, being one in spirit and in mind. All those advantages that we have as Christians, all those advantages are the reasons for our unity and our sacrificial service together. Now, being together after a while as Christians in a church is not all praise songs and potlucks, is it? <laughs> I've been a pastor a long time, and I've seen some beautiful things in the fellowship of Jesus' people. And I've seen some ugly stuff. And no church is impervious to that kind of stuff happening. We're just not always going to like each other. We're going to have some strong disagreements about theology, politics, money, how it should be spent. We're going to make each other tired. Sometimes the neediness of one wears on another. You just don't know if you can put up with any more neediness because we're needy people. We have personality differences. Have you noticed that? Yeah. 
We have value differences. We have differences of heritage. You know, our Burmese brothers and sisters have come from a worldview completely different than I did in South Dakota in a town of 1,200 people where we never locked our doors. Can you imagine how far apart our worlds are? And yet Jesus brings us together. So in this passage, Paul meddles. He meddles with our attitudes. Verses 3 and 4 begin this way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Moi? Who, me? Selfish ambition? Surely not. Vain conceit could never happen. I am the epitome of humility. <laughs> Till I'm on a board. I remember early on, Pastor Dave asking if I was interested in being on the shepherding team. I go, no, I'm not. I am really bad. I'm a nasty guy on boards. I'm short-tempered, frustrated. I am not this happy guy you see right here. <laughs> it's hard. Vain conceit. These are like evil twins that live in all of us. And they're dangerous. So, here's an important thing. Get this. What will destroy love and unity in a church or in a group of Christians or in a home? What will destroy love and unity are not our legitimate differences of opinion. And they will be there. Not our values and backgrounds and our opinions. Those things don't have to destroy us. What will destroy us is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. Selfish ambition. Vain conceit. I want my way. I have my rights. Send those evil twins to the cellar. Lock the door. And don't let them out no matter how much they scream. Now he continues in verse 3. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you, each of you to the interests of others. I'm going to jump to a verse I don't know if I've used any verse in pastoral counseling more than this one. First three verses, actually, but I'll just quote one from James chapter 4, verse 1. Some couple sits in front of me, or somebody's angry with somebody else at church. Golly, that happens a lot. And this, we have this conversation. Here's what James says. What causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Don't they spring from your own evil desires that are at war within you. And in answer to that question, I go, no, not really. It's not really that. It's them. <laughs> and the Bible says, no, it's not. You want something and you don't get it. So you quarrel, you kill and covet. You don't have because you don't ask God. And if you ask, you ask for the wrong reason, to spend what you get on your pleasures, making yourself happy. That's what Paul is talking about here. Our differences aren't the danger. The reason Christian growth is stunted in any one of us, the place where it kind of runs up against a wall, isn't our differences. It's our selfishness. It's the battle for humility and love that goes on within us. 
Now, if you didn't know what was coming next, if you'd never read this, if you had a page turn right there, you might think that Paul might go on and say, so just plain stop it for crying out loud. Behave yourselves for a change. But he doesn't say that. Look at what he says next in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now that's important. That is actually the centerpiece of this whole passage. It all pivots right here. I think we should read it together. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. I don't think you got it yet. Let's do it again. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Here's how we lock those evil twins in the cellar. That's how we do it. Here's how we humble ourselves enough to value others above ourselves, which is so difficult sometimes. It's how we focus on what's best for the other person. So how do we do this difficult thing, have this mindset? That's not easy, to have the mindset of Jesus, right? That's a tall order. How do we think like Jesus? How do we sort things out the way he did? Now, a word of transition. Paul is going to usher us next onto holy ground. He is going to take us to some ideas that are extraordinary. He's going to walk us into the mind and footsteps of Jesus Christ in his downward descent so that we will know how we are to think about our relationships with each other. That's why Paul's put this here. It's interesting, these next verses stand alone, and they, are the, they could be the heartbeat, the, the centerpiece of every worship service we have. But he didn't put them that way. He put them in this context of how we deal with each other, this mindset of Jesus. These verses, at least... Uh, seem to have a kind of poetry about them, a kind of uh, structure, like a hymn. Some scholars think that this was actually a hymn of the early church that Paul picked up, or, or maybe he composed it, maybe he wrote it, but there is a, 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 a beauty to the way these lines come to us. I think of these next verses as a kind of steep, dark, dangerous staircase. And we are asked to follow Jesus down these steps, which is what we're going to do for the rest of this message. This is dangerous ground we're working on, walking on. You kind of have to hang on. The steps are very steep. And we're going to a very dark place. If we are to, uh, to treat each other properly, here's the point. Never forget the humility and service of Christ Jesus. Never forget the humility and service of Christ Jesus. All of this he did in order to save us to serve you so that we could be here together this morning. Amen. He begins, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. 
To begin with, let's be very clear, Jesus was fully God. He was God through and through. This was one of the, this was the overriding lesson of our whole year in the Gospel of John. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's what this is saying. He was fully God. The verb, the Greek verb that uh, Paul uses here means that he was uh, being in the past fully God and he is in the present fully God. He's always fully God. He never stops being fully God. Contrary to Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons who say he was divine but not fully God with the Father and the Spirit. He can't stop being God. I want to make sure that's clear because what we're going to see is him divesting himself. And we want to understand that. But he never stops being God. Did you notice it said he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, to take an advantage of? Consider. This is something Jesus thought about. The Son of God in the triune God considered this. They weighed it. Another synonym is they reckoned it. He reckoned it. They wanted to save sinners and restore us as sinners to fellowship with God, to have love, a loving relationship and obedience to him. But how? What are the options? The infinite mind of God finally came to the only way it could be. They considered it. The Son of God considered and he decided in the company of the Trinity that he would lay aside his rights. He laid aside, we call him the prerogatives, the rights that he has coming to us, to him. You know, he, as the Son of God, could do anything, anything he wished. He could know all things. He could be present everywhere. He was all-powerful. He could do anything. And even though he deserved the worship and the submission of all the things he had created, he didn't have to cling to those advantages and rights. That's amazing. Even though he's God, he knew that was the best way to serve us. He knew what so often escapes us, that for the sake of love, you can give up your rights and your privileges without losing who you are. Christ proved, in fact, that giving up our rights and privileges out of love is the very thing God himself has done. That's the mindset we're called to. Now at this stage of this message, there should be some people's names passing through your mind, some relationship issues, some tensions, some dilemmas. Maybe it was just me, I don't know. He followed through on this decision according to verse 7. Rather than hanging on to these rights, verse 7, he made himself nothing. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. You don't need to really know Greek or anything to know the 
word of God, but there is a word here that is famous. It's the word kenosis, and it means emptying himself. He, this translation, he made himself nothing. Other translations, he emptied himself. It's hard to get this because he didn't stop being God. He didn't give up his holiness or his love. He didn't give up his relationship with the Father and the Spirit. There were things he didn't give up. But what he gave up was everything that was necessary for him to become one of us. And that's a lot. He emptied himself. He set aside his God abilities, you might say, to know everything, to be everywhere, to do anything. He set aside his crown and with it the submission of the universe. It stopped. He laid down his scepter and with it his authority to have his own way. In the end, it's like we sing, emptied himself of all but love. Remember that line? And bled for Adam's helpless race, emptied himself of all but love. Now, let me clarify something. Sometimes when we're reading the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, we read about a miracle or some astonishing thing that Jesus did, and we think to ourselves, well, of course he could. He was God. He can do anything. He can know everything. But that's not really right. Jesus laid aside all his all-knowingness. He laid aside his omnipotence. He only acted in his life on earth as we can act, and that is by faith and attention to God. When he healed, it was because the Father summoned him to do it and gave him the power in that moment, and he believed it. Jesus didn't function as the Son of God, if you get my meaning. He functioned as a human being with the limits we have, but in full fellowship and attention to the Father. That's a big deal. He gave up that instant ability he had. He'd set it aside to become like you and me. He gave up his capacities to change nature, to see the future, or to raise the dead. Those things happened because of his faith in the Father and his obedience to the promptings of the Father. Jesus did not give up his holiness. I want to be sure you understand. He didn't give up his infinite virtues, but he did lay aside all that lets God do whatever God wants to do. Now there's another step. Taking the very nature of a servant. Just a moment ago, he said he was in very nature God. Now we have him taking the very nature of a servant. That is, a nature he did not have before. Not like he dug deep and, you know, found another side of his personality. God has always served his people. I remember reading by Bonhoeffer that God's first service to anyone is that he listens. We pray to God asking him to intervene in some way because we believe he is able and he might serve us in our prayers. He doesn't have to do that. He gives us our daily bread. It's a service. But God's nature is to reign and rule. He does these things because he's the God of all. He serves his people. He serves all kinds of people, even the rebels, from his high position of infinite power and control as a kind and generous king. But here, the Son of God divests himself 
of all the mighty royal privileges of his God nature and instead fills his mind and his emotions and his desires with the very nature and heartbeat of a servant. A willing, bottom of the ladder, whatever I can do for you, towel carrying, head bowing, empty pockets, servant. Listen, you and I may know some people who we think are very servant hearted, and it's a privilege. But no human being has ever been born with a servant nature because sin fouled that up. Sin made us proud and selfish. No one, no human being has ever had the nature of a servant till Jesus was born. And he took on the very nature of a servant. Servanting became his natural thing. Isn't that amazing? We believe that Jesus possessed two natures, divine and human. But it's equally amazing that he possessed the very nature of God and the very nature of a servant. He says, have that mindset. Now, another step. Being made in human likeness. <clears throat> this is an incredible downward step for the Son of God who had lived eternally unbound by time or place or strength. He became a baby. And he was nowhere else. It wasn't that the Son of God is in this baby and he's really other places too. All of the Son of God came into the child Jesus, into the man Jesus. The Son of God was all there. And he was confined by genes and DNA and IQ like we are. He was vulnerable to pain and age and sorrow. And sharpest of all, he was tempted in the same ways that we are, yet did not sin, which is even harder. And he was able to feel the blunt force trauma of death and grief. As you can see in the way this reads, that phrase is linked to this business of taking the very nature of a servant. Christ was born as a man because, as I said before, that was the very best way that the almighty, all-knowing God could think of to save us from our sins. The services we most needed, God with us, and for God to die in our place, meant Jesus had to come and serve us in the flesh. What a step down. And there's another. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. We'll stop there for a moment. The Son of God, where we learn in other passages, <clears throat> in the divine trinity, the Son of God was the actual voice of creation. He was the one who was the creator. He is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. He gave orders. He didn't receive them. He didn't obey them. But the most essential duty of a human being is to love God and obey him forever. 
the Son of God had never done that. There had been a unity, an agreement in the, in the Trinity. Because of our sinful natures as human beings, we do not and never will obey, obey God fully and love him completely. Deep inside of us, there rises up this protest, who made you the boss of me? So Jesus Christ, appearing in our world as a man with a servant's heart, humbles himself further to the point of absolute, unquestioning obedience to the Father. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says something that just, I remember first reading this and going, what? Look at this. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who believe him. The son of man, Jesus, did not come born into this world as the perfect human being. He wasn't perfect till he had to obey. And he had to obey the hardest thing God has ever asked. When Jesus knelt there in the Garden of Gethsemane and cried, let this cup pass from me, he was wrestling with obedience. And when he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, that was the epitome, the high point the apex of humanity toward God. That is what led him to the cross. That's what set him apart. That is the step down. Humbled himself in obedience. And then it goes on, becoming obedient to death. Another step. Steeper than the last. For obeying the Father meant for Jesus to die. Could any command of God be harder to understand, let alone to obey? To die. Could anything be farther from the throne of God than death? Humanity's ultimate weakness. Could anything be less godlike than dying? Death is the ultimate human indignity. A corpse is the shame of humanity, the ultimate proof of our weakness and our sin and our mortality. And Jesus died. There was even more at stake for Jesus to die than someone else. For the death of the Son of God would seem to threaten the very nature of the triune God. It's a mystery to me. And it certainly seemed to threaten the promises of God made that would be uh, made true through the Messiah. If the Messiah died, how could he fulfill all the promises God had made? How could Jesus save and delight his people if he was dead? But Jesus was humble, trusting, a servant enough to obey. And then came the final phrase of this poem. It's as jarring as a smeared blood stain or as symbols falling from a stage. Even death on a cross. There's only one step further down that the sun could take from death, and it was this kind of death. It was painful, of course. It was humiliating. It was defeating, it seemed. 
It was devastating. William Hendrickson, a great Bible commentator, wrote this. Thus, while he was hanging on that cross, from below, Satan and all his hosts assailed him. From round about, men heaped scorn upon him. From above, God dropped upon him the pallor of darkness, symbol of the curse. And from within, there arose the bitter cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Into this hell, the hell of Calvary, Christ descended. And there, my dear friends, is the mindset of Christ. Think on that. He told us if we were to follow him, we need to take up our cross. That means we have to die to ourselves in order to love Jesus and his people. Growing Christians learn to die. We learn to die to ourselves. Humility is dying. Giving up our rights, being the servant of others, even when we're treated like a servant, taken for granted, all for Jesus' sake, especially our fellow believers, knowing that we will meet, that we will be met in heaven with this, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your reward, which is what awaited Christ. Here is Jesus' reward. It's not the end of the story. Finally, verses 9 to 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Rest assured that we will be caught up in the hyper-exalting of Jesus. Here in our Bibles, uh, the translation says, uh, God exalted him to the highest place. Paul didn't have a word for that in Greek. They had a word for exalt. It wasn't a big enough word. So he made up a word. He added a hyper to the word. The Greek word is hooper oopsimon. <laughs> Does it sound right? Doesn't it? You can know that word. It means highly exalted. That's what's translated for us here. There was no word in their language that would capture just how great is the exaltation of Jesus. Jesus returned to heaven with far greater glory, if you can believe that, than what he left. Did you know that? He wasn't the same when he went back. Because he returned not only as the Son of God, but also as Jesus, the Messiah, the King of God's redeemed people, the Savior, the Son of Man. He did things as the Son of Man that God had never done, nor could he do before he came to earth. It was here among us that he became the perfect human being. There had never been one since the first days of Adam. He became the second Adam. He became the first sinless, immortal human. He returned to heaven as the author and finisher of our faith, the bridegroom of the church. All those things that he wasn't before, he brought with him when he ascended on high. What's more, he carried with him to that place the obedience he'd learned in suffering so that when we cry out to him in our suffering, he is able to sympathize with us in our weakness. 
What's more, he carried with him to that highest place the experience of obedience. He carries his servant nature to this day. Did you know that? He didn't didn't lay it aside. He is still the servant, blended with his royal nature, so that Jesus Christ lives now and forever to serve you and me and the lost people of this world. Luke chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus is telling a story, and he gives us a glimpse of heaven that you might not have noticed. Listen to this. Jesus said, it'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. That's us, or ought to be. Truly, I tell you, get this, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve We'll have them recline at the table and he will come and wait on them. That is the banquet of heaven. That's astonishing. And Jesus Christ is still human in heaven. That's another thing we don't always realize. He now is the living human being, the eternally living human being, the best human being. That's who he is now. He remains Jesus, glorified human. It's what we soon shall be. We will be like him, Scripture says. And it says God gave him the name that is above every name. It was only at the incarnation that the Son of God became Jesus the Messiah. Jesus means God saves, for he will save his people from their sins. It was Jesus, having descended all those dark steps, finally declared in his last words, it is finished, and the Father said, he has done it. And therefore, that name of Jesus is freighted now in heaven with more glory and more honor and more meaning than any other name. In heaven or earth. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's nothing more right or more true or more necessary in all this world than that all creation should bow to the name of Jesus and all confess that he is the Lord. The truth of that has been muffled too long. For too long, Satan has roamed this world robbing Jesus of his glory. For too long, the great of this world, the kings and the presidents and the tycoons and the generals, the heroes and the stars, have crowed about their own greatness, but never about Jesus. For too long, scholars and gurus and false teachers and philosophers have preached empty philosophies, Christless, hopeless sermons, petty platitudes, and unkeepable promises. For too long, for too long, the name of Jesus has been unmentionable in polite society. Unwelcome in the conversations of men, except when they searched for an empty oath or a punctuating curse. Too long. But the time is coming when the truth will be told, when his name will be shouted. The cacophony of unbelief will finally be silenced. No more of this equivocating and shushing and doubting and cursing and denying and defying. For 2,000 years, this summary doctrine of the church has been, Jesus is Lord. But we have shouted it into the darkness and the, the cries of the world. Our faith has always been 
drowned out in the clamor and intimidated by the tumult. But no more, no more. For when the gates of heaven finally swing open for all to see, when all eyes are opened, when the last battle is won and Christ has triumphed, when the church has finally been brought to her bridegroom, when the accounts have all been settled, then from every corner of creation, from heaven's courts and hell's dungeons, from 10,000 languages of men and angels, even from creation itself, which has groaned in the waiting for it all to come, will rise one unison declaration, Jesus Christ is Lord. All of it, all of these wonders will resound to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen.